Good evening. I'm John. I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore. We're pleased to welcome Mike Timor and Britt Bennett this evening in support of their recent books. Um, some Zoom etiquette. You heard me as you uh, were connecting, but um, you're muted. You'll stay muted. We just ask that you leave your video off as well. But please feel free to give feedback using your Zoom reaction functions, thumbs up, hearts, claps, those kinds of things so we know you're there and enjoying things. Um, following the reading and conversation, we'll have time for an audience Q&A. The chat is closed, but you can send your questions directly to me using the chat feature at any time. And at the conclusion of the conversation, I will ask your questions. So once again, the, the chat is closed to the public, but you can send me um, your questions whenever you'd like, um, and I will ask them. As a reminder, you can purchase Brit and Wyatu's books on our websites, and I'll include a link in the chat as well. And if you're watching later on YouTube, there will be links below in the description. You can shop for more books at literatiebookstore.com. Select titles are also available for curbside pickup if you live in Southeast Michigan. Uh, in lieu of a book purchase, we'd also ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming. Uh, whether you'd like to think of that as this week's or this month's or this year's subscription, you can uh, make a, a donation at literatibookstore.com slash donation. Um, otherwise, we simply thank you for joining us and attending this evening uh, or this afternoon or this morning, depending on wherever in the world you may be um, tuning in from. So with that, I'd like to welcome our guests this evening. Uh, White Two Moore is the author of She Would Be King and the founder of One More Book. She's a graduate of Howard University, Columbia University, and the University of Southern California. She lives in Brooklyn, and her latest book is The Dragons, The Giant, The Women, a memoir. And starting us off tonight with a reading is Britt Bennett, the author of the New York Times bestselling novel, The Mothers, finalist for the NBCC John Leonard Prize for the best first book, the Penn Robert W. Bingham Prize for debut fiction, and the New York Public Library Young Lions Award and a National Book Foundation 5 Under 35 honoree. Her work has been featured in The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Paris Review, and Jezebel, her latest novel, The Vanishing Half. Please uh, use your Zoom <laughs> clap reaction functions to help me welcome Britt and Maya to, to your living rooms. Hi, hi everybody. Um, thank you for that introduction, John. Thank you everyone watching. Thank you, Waitu, um, for, for inviting me um, to, to do this. Um, so I think I'm just gonna start with a really brief reading from the beginning of the book. So you will need no context to follow along. Um, and yeah, this is just from the opening of The Vanishing Half. The morning one of the lost twins returned to Mallard, Lou LeBon ran to the diner to break the news. And even now, many years later, everyone remembers the shock of sweaty Lou pushing through the glass doors, chest heaving, neckline darkened with his own effort. The barely awake customers clamored around him, 10 or so, although more would lie and say that they'd been there too, if only to pretend that this once they'd witnessed something truly exciting. In that little farm town, nothing surprising ever happened, not since the Veen twins had disappeared. But that morning in April 1968, on his way to work, Lou spotted Desiree Veen walking along Partridge Road, carrying a small leather suitcase. She looked exactly the same as when she'd left at 16, still light, her skin the color of sand, barely wet, her hipless body reminding him of a branch caught in a strong breeze. She was hurrying, her head bent, and Lou paused here, a bit of a showman. She was holding the hand of a girl, seven or eight, and black as tar. Blue black, he said, like she flown direct from Africa. Lou's egg house splintered into a dozen different conversations. The line cook wondered if it had been Desiree after all, since Lou was turning 60 in May and still too vain to wear his eyeglasses. The waitress said that it had to be, even a blind man could spot a veen girl, and it certainly couldn't have been that other one. The diners, abandoning grits and eggs on the counter, didn't care about that veen foolishness. Who on earth was the dark child? Could she possibly be Desiree's? Well, who else's could it be, Lou said. He grabbed a handful of napkins from the dispenser, dabbing his damp forehead. Maybe it's an orphan that got took in. 
I just don't see how nothing that black could have come out of Desiree. Desiree seemed like the type to take in no orphan to you. Of course she didn't. She was a selfish girl. If they remembered anything about Desiree, it was that, and most didn't recall much more. The twins had been gone 14 years, nearly as long as anyone had ever known them. Vanished from bed after the Founders Day dance while their mother slept right down the hall. One morning, the twins crowded in front of their bathroom mirror, four identical girls fussing with their hair. The next, the bed was empty, the covers pulled back like any other day, taut when Stella made it, crumpled when Desiree did. The town spent all morning searching for them, calling their names through the woods, wondering stupidly if they had been taken. Their disappearance seemed as sudden as the rapture, all of Mallard the sinners left behind. Naturally, the truth was neither sinister nor mystical. The twins soon surfaced in New Orleans, selfish girls running from responsibility. They wouldn't stay away long. City living would tire them out. They'd run out of money and gall and come sniffling back to their mother's porch. But they never returned again. Instead, after a year, the twins scattered, their lives splitting as evenly as their shared egg. Stella became white, and Desiree married the darkest man she could find. Now she was back, Lord knows why. Homesick, maybe. Missing her mother after all those years, or wanting to flaunt that dark daughter of hers. In Mallard, nobody married dark. Nobody left either, but Desiree had already done that. Marrying a dark man and dragging his blue-black child all over town was one step too far. In Lou's egg house, the crowd dissolved, the line cook snapping on his hairnet, the waitress counting nickels on the table, men in coveralls gulping coffee before heading out to the refinery. Lou leaned against the smudged window, staring out at the road. He ought to call Adele Vane. Didn't seem right for her to be ambushed by her own daughter, not after everything she'd already been through. Now Desiree and that dark child, Lord. He reached for the phone. You think they fixed the stay? The line cook asked. Who knows? She sure seemed in a hurry though, Lou said. Wonder what she hurrying to. Look right past me, didn't wave or nothing. Uppity. And what reason she got to be uppity? Lord, Lou said. I never seen a child that black before. I think I will stop there. Thanks for that, Britt. Um, I actually, I was going to, I previously was going to read from what I like to call the Tinder chapter, but um, instead I'll, I'll, I'll read something that um, is, is uh, I think, better paired with what Britt, Britt read. Um, so I, this, my, my memoir is told in um, four sections. One is five-year-old me, the other is present-day me, and um, the other's in my mother's voice and then back to five-year-old me. So I'm going to actually be reading to you from um, present-day voice. Sata, I was still broken. I wanted a way out from thoughts of him, and Sata's memory came to me one night and stayed. It was a dream about her jug of palm oil, which she carried like a baby that day she came for us. I woke up and said her name in the dark, surprised to have remembered it all those years later. At that point, I could not remember, remember when last I had been outside. Some weeks prior, I went to a store just below Eastern Parkway, one of the only stores of its kind that still existed among a deluge of coffee shops and yoga studios to buy palm oil and frozen cassava leaf to make the dish I knew would heal me the only Liberian dish I made that tasted like mams. When I arrived, a sign informed me that the store had closed indefinitely and returning to my apartment, I felt everything I had been avoiding crashing hard into me, tears staining my skin. I have not been able to wash them off for some time. Before moving there, I rid the place of ghosts. I burned sage, the Oma say the spirits do not like the odor. I then called ma'am and asked her to pray, certain they would listen to her voice ascending in that musical way it did from my phone speaker before they obeyed mine. I've been thinking about that woman, I told her that late fall. What woman, ma'am asked. The rebel from the war, I, I dreamed about her. Oh, she said when the silence overstayed. Have you spoken to Kay recently? A couple days ago, I said. And you've eaten today? I made cereal, I said. Her name was Sata, right? Yes, she said and breathed deeply into the phone. You'll be all right, Tutu. And ma'am made that sound of married curiosity and indifference, an impossibility, her best invention. 
The five or so steps from my bed to the kitchen felt like uphill lunges. I spent too long looking into mirrors, too long sleeping, buried under covers still marked with our collective smell. Every moment I was not working. I had made it to the, little, to the living room that day and I opened the large window where I placed a vase of Mam's favorite flowers, lilies, now dried and unrecognizable in the escaping sun. The sill was cold when I climbed onto it and I rested my slippers on the fire escape where children played below as we once did. And the Brooklyn drivers honked in the street while bits of conversations and laughter spilled from their car windows on the backs of words like move and fell and going and tomorrow and the sirens came toward me from the distance, then disappeared again behind those words. And the new transplants hurried home, as gentrifiers do when it's almost dark and they're still fearful of corners. I leaned against my still and wondered how I smelled, how I looked, if music would ever sound the same, especially those songs I knew by heart. We called shortly after, and I almost didn't answer the phone because I didn't care for the questions. How are you? She asked this while exhaling, her daughter's loud in the background. I'm fine. I answered, you getting your work done? I am, I said, fighting the urge to look at my computer desk, the remote office where I spent a few hours a day consulting and freelance writing, then glaring into the orbit while an unedited novel sat idle on a minimized screen. Did you get out today? She sighed again. I'm outside now, I mumbled, staring through the holes beneath my feet, three stories down to the ground below. Outside, outside, or on your fire escape? I didn't answer. So she said my name in that way only ma'am could. Then there was that familiar litany of consolations, fumbling pauses and attempts to make me laugh, her optimism harsh against my ears. She reprimanded her girls every few minutes and if I were well, I would have smiled. She was that good at it. I'll be fine, I said, I just need time. And I needed my cassava leaf, the way they made it in La, spread over parboiled white rice drenched in oil with shrimp, with dry fish and pepper that wounded my lips, reddened my skin and those meats that required both hands to eat. New York. By my mid-twenties, the transients around me were already collecting AA chips from too many weekends in Chelsea, habits that always felt unnatural to me because I have a low tolerance for pain and hangovers, and because a fundamentally shadow of mam and papa's early Sunday mornings in Texas, even during my self-proclaimed late teen rebellion, remained. My habit during those years was love stories. Grand, provoking, almost silly, intoxicating, plagiarized from romantic comedies and Old Testament scripture. I had fallen in love in that city and then out of it too many times to count. And so I fit in perfectly there. And that way wanderers like myself do in refined cities where most wear love like loose garments, but he's stuck. No, thank you. Love it. Thank you. Thank you for reading this. Thank you for inviting me to do this. Yeah, it's well. I remember when we first met. I think the first time we hung out, we realized that we had our books coming out on the same day. Yeah. <laughs> and so yes, yeah. it felt it felt a little faded. Um, so um, so yeah, I guess we'll just talk about our books. I have some questions for you about yours. Um, you too. I have questions for you too, and I and I and I wonder how much of the process questions you want to answer and how. <laughs> you want to answer <laughs> it's like well can I have a I have a question about process so do I um yeah we could we could do both okay. um so but if if I if ahead. I can start um <laughs> um so so one of the things I wanted to ask you so you talked a little bit about the structure of your book which I found really fascinating mm -hmm. um so my first question is the book starts like you said um with yourself when you are five um, I was curious of why you decided to start so close to your immediate child self, um, mm -hmm. because I, I find it really hard to write from the perspective of children in general, let mm -hmm. alone the child that I once was. I've never <laughs> attempted to do that. Um, yeah. And that seems really difficult. So I was curious if you could talk a little bit about that, the experience of writing about the past in this mm -hmm. way that feels so immediate and present and, and mm -hmm. yourself in that child moment as a child why you decide to start there right um i feel like in many ways in order to write about that period in my life i i couldn't write about it in the present day because anytime i am recalling what happened it's a lot more of an emotional process and i find myself like stunted um and unable to continue in the same way um whereas if i use some fiction 
action tools and devices, sort of place myself in the body of this five-year-old me and go through the motions, um, then all of a sudden I'm, I'm able to digest what's happening in the story and what happened in real life. And so that was, that was always something that, that, um, something that I was going to do because it was, it's, it's a device that helped me actually um, while writing about an experience that was, that was so, so traumatic. Right. Um, and so, so that's why I chose. And I mean, there, I would say a lot of my, my writing is done during the editing process um, because that's when I can check myself and my editor can check me and say, well, this isn't childlike voice or <laughs> think about um, this perspective or, um, or this, or, you know, just this structure um, and how it could help you to translate what it is that you experienced um, for the reader. And so especially, that was especially true, I think, of this book as well, because when you are writing nonfiction, obviously compared to fiction, it's making characters of people in your life, right? right, right. They, it's an intimidating experience, an intimidating process. Yeah. I found that I was withholding um, quite a bit. So I was I was actually really blessed by the editing process because it sort of forced me to approach those things. And I could use, because of my experience in fiction, some yeah. fiction and devices to approach those things that I think if I were just, um, if I were just employing memory and recalling these things that were happening from the present day voice, it would have been a lot more difficult. Right, right. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Do you, do, are we going to do it back and forth? What do you Let's think? Let's just do back and forth. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, the, the, the relationship in the, in, in your book that fascinated me the most was when Stella moved into obviously this great neighborhood and she has a family and she, um, she meets an African American woman, a progressive who is the first in her neighborhood. And there was a, a, a section or was a moment in that friendship where it seemed as if the woman would expose Stella and then, and then you kind of pulled back from it. And I wondered if you did like lean into that, if that would have totally changed the story. Yeah. When yeah. someone who in her adulthood, like a friend and associate and certainly someone who was exposed to the people in her life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so one, I mean, I, I think that that was, um, that was a sort of a relationship that I stumbled into as I was writing the story. Um, I think originally when I thought about um, Stella's life, I thought, you know, her arc in that part of the book was going to be her learning that this Black family wants to move in and her thwarting them. Like that was going to be the whole thing. Um, and then, you know, I think as, as when you're writing fiction, you're always thinking about like, how can you push people to their brink? Um, so you can't sort of let them off easy. So, so, um, you know, I, I remember I had a, a writing teacher once who said to ask yourself, like, what's the worst thing that could happen to this character? And then what comes next after that? Um, which is pretty sadistic, but I think that it, it helps me think about, um, how to sort of, uh, increase the tension in a story, raise the stakes. So when I was thinking about Stella, someone who was going to be panicked at the possibility of this, of this Black family moving in because she's afraid of them exposing her, I realized that it was sort of boring if she stops them. Like, they have to be able to move into the neighborhood, and then what happens yeah. after that? Um, so the relationship yeah. kind of came out of that. Um, and to your question about, about uh, Loretta, sort of whether she is going to expose Stella or not, that was definitely something that I also thought about a lot. Um, I wrote lots of different versions and lots of different iterations of what could happen in that dynamic. Um, but I think ultimate, wait, can you say that again? I said it was so juicy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I think ultimately what became interesting to me was the way that I felt like almost through that friendship was sort of Stella fully stepping into her whiteness. <laughs> like she is able to fully leverage the power afforded to her as a white woman and the power that she has over this black woman who is also wealthy, who is also has, you know, uh, some privilege and some status because she's able to, you know, afford to live in that neighborhood, but it's still black. So the fact that she has this, this power over this, this black woman and leverages it in the way that she does 
to me, that was the moment where Stella kind of steps to that door and that door sort of slams shut behind her. <laughs> like there was, that was kind of the point where there was really no going back for her, it felt like. Um, so I didn't want her. And also I, I felt just if she got sort of tripped up there, I didn't know where the story would go beyond that. I was so interested in thinking, okay, what happens next? What happens next? This person who's committed so fully to this, this new life and this new role, I wanted to see that unfold. Um, so I didn't want to thwart her early, but I think really in that relationship, I was interested in, um, the way that, that the dynamics of that relationship exposes something about Stella to herself. And she's someone who constantly feels like she's a fraud, but in that moment, she has sort of truly committed to the act. Yeah. Did you ever feel sorry for her? For Stella? Yeah. Like how, like the, the <laughs> evidence self-hatred. <laughs> Do you ever feel sorry for any of your characters? Um, I do sometimes. Um, I, I, I did feel sorry for Stella, I think. I felt empathy for her. Um, mm -hmm. I felt that she was somebody who was very wounded um, mm -hmm. and she was running from those wounds. Um, so to me, that, that, felt, uh, that felt more like what was motivating her than even anything about race necessarily. It was just sort of, she wanted to reinvent herself. She wanted to feel safe. She wanted to feel protected. And the way that she was able to access that was through whiteness, at least in her, in her mind. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely felt empathy for her. Um, I, I, that's a funny question. I don't know if I've ever thought about feeling sorry for my characters, mm -hmm. but there are some I think you feel protective of. I definitely have characters that I feel really protective about. Mm -hmm. um, and there are characters that, you know, you do, you do sort of sometimes want to shield them in the same yeah. way that I said that you're like moving towards the sort of sadistic impulse to like, you know, put them in tough situations and push them to their brink. You do sometimes have that feeling of wanting, wanting to shield them, but I don't think Stella was one of those characters for me. Yeah. Um, but, but I do feel that sometimes for my characters. Yeah. 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 I, I certainly do. I think I do. And I actually have to, to fight the impulse to, to create these neatly packaged stories where yes. they find happiness and their fullness and their peace. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and then go your route where I'm actually challenging them and moving in the yeah. direction. But I well, feel like... Yeah. Um, well, sort of along those lines, I'm curious for you, um, in, in this book, um, you talked about the writing nonfiction is making characters out of the people in your life. So I'm so curious to know what the experience of that was like for you, particularly writing about your parents. Um, you know, it was... This is the second time I've read a memoir written by someone that I know. So it's always like kind of funny and strange to read, yeah. um, to read your book and knowing conversations we'd had and what I knew um, about you and your relationship with your parents and then reading the book. Um, so um, you clearly um, love your parents very much and you're close to your parents. And I think that that love comes through when you're reading the book. But I'm curious about just that experience of writing about people you know, particularly people who are very close to you. Yeah. What, what was that like? Yeah, well, I think, in many ways, like I, I, I mentioned before about how it was um, a very dramatic experience within my childhood. Um, but in many ways, I was desensitized. I have been desensitized to this story because I, I feel like it's been an explanation of my identity for my entire life. So people would ask, you know, oh, where are you from? Or I, specifically in Texas, you know, I was raised in a very white, homogenous, conservative town. And people are wondering, oh, you're from Africa, like what part are you from and what brought you here? Yeah. So I was always telling some version of this story. So it didn't necessarily feel like, um, um, I think the novelty of it had worn off by the time that I was ready to put it together into one comprehensive piece. Um, so because of that, um, I was not as sensitive about writing about the people I think mm -hmm. the challenge, or the comparison of, of fiction and nonfiction, fiction sort of deals with, with, with these abstracts, right? It, it's, it functions in abstractions and you're trying to concretize these abstract themes, whereas in nonfiction, you're dealing with the concrete and trying mm -hmm. to abstract right. more, right? That's really so smart, it, yeah. It's the inverse experience. And so, right. I, you know, I, I approach it as I know this story, I've been telling this story or exploring this story in some form for a while. Right. Um, what does it mean? What can, what can I make of it? Um, right. And so that was, that was, I would say the challenge. And then, 
because I knew that it was more of um, like a craft exercise in many ways mm -hmm. for me, what I had to do was also resist um, like using these people in my life um, as tools <laughs> in right. the way that I would use your characters. Characters, and right. <laughs> so having those sensitivities that, that you don't necessarily have to have in fiction, right. of course, um, that is something that, uh, that was, that was, I would say, probably the only challenging part of, of the process. That and the hesitation around my mom reading yeah. parts of the book and, and yeah. her feeling as if I represented her and her story and her perspective well. Um, right. But I mean, I got, I got, I think I got the appro approval from her <laughs> during the editing process. I let her read one of the, one of the drafts and, and she was happy. Right. happy. Well, I mean, that's good. And also sort of corollary to that, when I was reading the book, when I got to the section that is written in your mother's voice, I was shocked. <laughs> I was not expecting it. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just sort of bowled over by how daring that is. Um, you know, I cannot imagine writing in my mother's voice. I, I write about my mother a lot. Um, but I, I cannot imagine writing in her voice. So I'm curious about how you did that. Did you was it, did it just come from knowing her? Did you like, you know, read, you know, first, you know, she had journal or something, you know, something that you were able to draw on. Did it just come from knowing her and just recreating that voice? And what was, were you right. afraid to do it? What was the experience? No, so my siblings and I, I think in some way or, or another, we're always imitating mm -hmm. my mom. Like, you know, like mm -hmm. telling us something, because she's so funny. She is such a character. Yeah. So we're imitating her in some way, like telling us, like, did you, did you, do you know mom called me yesterday and said? And, right, right. And so, so that, knowing her voice, that's something that, that I would say um, came naturally. Mm -hmm. um, so a first draft of this book, it was in first, first person or of this chapter, because I would say mm -hmm. that I had written many parts of this book in fragments and it only mm -hmm. came together um, two times. One, when I returned to Liberia for the first time and then during editing. Mm -hmm. And it was, it wasn't her voice, but it was shorter. It was maybe mm -hmm. just the beginning of that section. And then I totally switched it over to third person. Mm -hmm. um, and I did have her read the third person and she just, she said, you know, this is something that's just a little off. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> This doesn't seem like you're writing. Okay, wow. <laughs> yeah. okay. And so, and then I said, well, yeah, I, I, I did write it in first person. You yeah. Know? And I think, you know, and so then I had her read that. She's like, yes, this is your voice. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, so I had tried to, because there was obviously like apprehension um, yeah. in that embodiment um, and wanting to, as I said, uh, do her story justice and do everything that she was going through justice. Right. Um, but that was definitely the employment of a fiction tool. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and there are things that about her story that I eliminated as well. I think I, I did um, keep it to, to, to the essential elements of, mm -hmm. of that experience. Right. And then I guess like before we go to questions talking about eliminations, like another character that fascinated me was Reese. And I don't know if you've, you've, you've gotten any questions about um, the elimination of Reese's backstory. Like, how do you choose what to, what to keep, um, what, yeah. you, what we should experience in absentia? Um, how do you make those decisions? Because I imagine they're, they're very difficult decisions. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think that there are a lot of characters that had a lot of backstory that did not make it into the book. Uh -huh. um, you know, I... I it's hard for me, I think, because as a novelist, my inclination is just like, you know, some minor person like walks into the diner and I'm like, I want to follow you for 50 pages. <laughs> and like, you know, you know, what is this person's story? Like, I'm, I'm always really interested in that. I think I, I am interested in the novel inherently as a, as a form that is about community. Um, and I know that not all novels are, but those are the types of novels that I really love, um, yeah. are novels that are not just sort of singular protagonists moving through the world. I just, I'm never drawn to that as a writer, <laughs> as a reader, really. Um, so I, I love that. And I also love that about omniscience, um, the sort of idea that any person walking into the diner, as the reader, you can tell that that person has as complex of an inner life as the main character does. You know, mm -hmm. I think that that's how I try to think about the world in general. So I, I, I like to represent that in fiction also. I just find it really fun. 
Um, so that, that creates a problem for me because, um, that would be, you know, an 800 page book of me going into every sort of minor character. Um, so I think a lot of it is always trying to think of what is sort of essential, um, as you were talking about, like thinking about your mother's story, like what are the essential parts of it? What's essential for the story that I am telling? Um, so with a character like Reese, I knew that he had this journey of reinvention. Um, I knew that he was escaping this traumatic past. Um, and there were echoes of that in some of the other characters of the sort of violence experienced in your family, um, the, yeah. the story about reinvention, changing yourself in some way. Um, and so I knew that there were some of those echoes that, that I wanted to include, but I originally had so much about Reese. I had so much about his childhood. Um, and, you know, ultimately, um, he, he ended up being, I think, one of the characters that people really like. People always want to talk to me about Reese. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was one of my favorite characters to write. I, I love him too. But, um, um, so, but, but ultimately I was like, okay, this is a story that is, you know, essentially about these twins and sort of these, uh -huh. you know, tendrils that are kind of sprouting out from them. So I wanted to, to keep that front and center. Um, and not to get too lost in the stories of all these other characters. Although I would have loved to like, you know, write about Barry for 20 pages and write about, you know, early, you know, for, you know, his sort of adventures on the road. I would have, I could have kept going about a lot of these characters, but yeah. I, I reeled it in so, um, so that it, it wouldn't get out of hand. But I, I love doing that about fiction. I think that's what I love about writing a novel. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Um, and then we wanted to do a, a Q and A now. Yeah, see if the, John had any questions from the audience, or I have many more to ask if there aren't yet. Yeah, we we don't have any questions yet. So, Britt, if there's questions that you haven't gotten to, feel free to ask. Yes. Um, and I will encourage all who are here to, to please send me your questions. Yes. Um, and I will ask them dutifully. Okay. I will Great. read them uh, and. And so if there's anything you've wanted to ask these authors, please feel free to type away. Um, but Great. Britt, I, I turn it back over to you. I have so many more. Thank you, John. Um, so, so one of the other questions um, that I was wondering about was, um, so again, a lot of the book is, is close to your experiences, but there is sort of other sort of larger uh, context that you provide um, about the Civil War. Um, so I was curious if you, how much research th that you did to supplement your own memories or, or the memories of people in your family, and sort of how do you balance the kind of historical truth of an event with the emotional truth of the event, if that makes any sense? How do you balance all those things as you're writing about something that you've experienced that is um, a, a very large event that has affected a lot of people at the same time? Yeah. So um, I wasn't raised around a lot of Liberians. I was raised, uh, I experienced Liberia and Liberians, like one, of course, at home. My parents did what they could to keep us tethered to our home culture. But um, during the summers, we would go to Minnesota and we would go to Memphis and hang out with family. And as part of most upbringings of Liberian Americans, um, specifically during the 90s, is that family members would sit around and talk about the war or what had happened during the war, what they lost, um, you know, hopes of going back. And so it sort of becomes just a part of your understanding of the country is all of these details of the war, the major events. Um, so a lot of it I was writing from um, knowledge of things that I, I had heard, um, mm -hmm. my own memory of conversations that I had had and then went in and filled out the details a little bit later on mm -hmm. um, based on what, um, based on obviously like some of these key events. Mm -hmm. But then also I think the, key, the, the, the primary research that, that I completed was actually in um, my exploration of the, the, the child soldiers, mm -hmm. the women. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, after this, this chapter that I read to you of Sata, this woman who had helped us, who had gotten us trafficked out of, out of Liberia, um, I connected with a journalist friend of mine who had created a few rehabilitative um, cultural programs in Liberia for uh -huh. child soldiers. And so she had an, an entire network of child soldiers and she said, you, you know, you should 
consider talking to some of them. And of course I was hesitant, like, no. And then I, I actually even spoke to my parents about it. They said, you know, we don't want yeah. you to have anything to do with that. But I knew that it was necessary just for me where I was in that point in, at that point in my life. And so I had a conversation with, um, with Agnes, that's her name, mm-hmm. and then set up interviews um, with, it was, it was probably about two dozen of these soldiers um, half were men, half were women, and two were um, previous rebel faction leaders. Uh-huh. And um, I think my research for the book primarily came from that because throughout, I, I, I found that I was struggling with the reality that this woman had essentially helped my family and directly contributed to the outcome of my life now. Uh-huh. Um, and, but at the same time, I'm sure that there are families who she had traumatized, right? Uh-huh. And so how do you make peace with, with that reality, with that juxtaposition? Uh-huh. Like how do you, uh, you know, what does it mean for someone to be good? Is it an act? Uh-huh. Um, you know, is she, is she a hero because she, she saved my family right. um, or culmination? And right. so the, the interviews for the most part, they gave me obviously context to the war, but then also context, um, toward the type of story that I wanted to tell and I was trying to tell. Right. Yeah. 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 I think, I mean, also, I mean, we've kind of circled around a little bit, but I I also was really um, fascinated by the way that you write about trauma in this book Um, and uh, the trauma of, of what you experience and also the experience of just surviving something. Um, And I, I, there was that, um, the line that I wrote down that I that I really loved was I think it was um, when you were talking uh, to a therapist um, and she said recognizing pain is not ungrateful. Um, I'm I'm curious if you if you could talk a little bit about the experience of of writing about trauma. I think that um, it's something that I I write about I think uh, in fiction and in a different way and obviously that's a different experience. Um, of, of fictionalizing something, um, but I'm curious if you could just talk about the, the process of writing about trauma. How how do you do it, um, and how do you do it in a way that that yeah that 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 you can like endure as a writer having to relive things, and also in a way that that becomes so powerful for the reader to sort of experience by proxy. Right. Um, well, I mentioned before using this tool of the you know. A, a, being removed from how I feel right. now in, right. in calling some of the emotions um, that I experienced during that time. So mm-hmm. perspective, I would mm-hmm. say, you know, writing in my childhood voice, writing in my mother's voice, I think mm-hmm. it, uh, was allowed me to be a bit emotionally extracted from mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the process. Um, humor as well. Mm-hmm. Like I felt the the tinder chapter was was one that yeah. it was so fun to write and i wrote it uh-huh. in the middle of sort of just going through this emotional roller coaster of everything that had happened not just in my childhood but then also with this pretty dramatic breakup uh-huh. um, and all of its detailed consequences yeah. and it so i feel like i i just i use devices i use tools um I, I pull away when I need to, uh-huh. um, but the perspective helped me a lot, like, like removing myself yeah. and um, employing fiction and al- almost approaching it as if I yeah. was writing a story that, that wasn't mine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The only way that I, I, I think that I was able to successfully get through it yeah. um, and resist the, just my reluctance to withhold and to keep yeah. things was just, okay, well then if these, are the characters and these are the players and what does this story look like um even even using that and even approaching it in that way i still at times had to step away um because i'm human but i think mostly like uh, being a novelist and 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 having experience in fiction helped me greatly that's that's really helpful Um, Yeah. yeah i think john has some questions from the audience yeah we've got some questions thank you for those of you who've submitted them um the first one is also the, that I was wondering, hearing both of you talk about um, uh, the process of writing your books, the sort of the lingering figures of your books, uh, also um, 
but now that you've also had sort of months with these books out in the world, um, in the, the question is in the process of editing and figuring out what you want to exclude from your books, do you ever set something aside that you know you'll revisit? Is that how the shape of the new or next book declares itself? Mm. That's a good question. <laughs> um, so I think sometimes. Um, so for me, um, so the character we talked about just now, Reese, Reese is a character who's a character from a short story that I started when I was um, in grad school at Michigan, uh, Though Blue. Um, so he was this character from short story and the short story was really bad. Uh, mm -hmm. but I just really loved that character. Um, so this was, you know, I don't know, 2012 or something. I was thinking about this character. Um, and he was a contemporary character. It was, a, it was a different story. Um, but, but that character just kind of stayed with me through these years. And when I started to think about this book and I wanted to write this big love story in the book and he just kind of popped into my mind as, oh, this would be a really great guy. Uh, for for this character to fall in love with. So that was something that, that this was a character that I thought, you know, that story was a failed story and I thought I was kind of moving on from it, but he stuck with me. Um, so I think sometimes there are, there are things like that that happen, um, but I think that's the first time that's ever really happened for me where a character who didn't survive in one iteration made it into another work. Uh, I'm curious, I'm curious to hear from, from you, White, too, if you've ever, just like, yeah. I, I, done surgery to <laughs> I don't think that they have I mean I do with the memoir probably more so because as I said I, I feel like I've been writing fragments for a long time and so when it all came together it did include things that I had written previously that I that I thought had a home here if, if mm -hmm. they wanted mm -hmm. um but for fiction no because I mean I I like you, I mean, you were, you were speaking before about um, the elimination of Reese and other characters' backstories. I definitely, I, I'm tangential as well when it comes to my, my characters, so I'll mm -hmm. go off on deep ends with mm -hmm. um, backstories and explorations. And so generally when they're cut, when they're cut, they're cut. <laughs> at some point, maybe at some point, um, I'll do something with those with those characters. But you know, even with with my novel, there was a there was a niche in a yeah, it was the first draft. Instead of three main characters, there were four. So mm -hmm. an entire character um, got the chopping block, and I can't say that I've ever thought to to revisit that character yeah. in another project you know just i usually just i usually just just let them go and then and then try to challenge myself to think of that's probably healthier <laughs> that'd be a good project i think that like that would be a good exercise I right so i mean it they're they're inspired by something mm -hmm. so, yeah. there's another question about the cutting room floor. Um, it's been fascinating to listen to both of you speak about things that you tried or may have wanted to include in the drafts, but ultimately didn't make it into your books. Are there any other notable things you tried or experimented with in the process of writing that you ultimately backed away from? Um, uh, yeah, probably lots of things. <laughs> um, I, um, I also, what, when you were saying that just now about cutting a main character. I did, um, originally the, the twins had a brother, um, who, mm -hmm. who I cut very early on. Um, oh, and <laughs> yeah, they had a brother who was a priest. Um, and older or younger, younger. Um, oh. and he was, you know, I think part of it is because threes are interesting. You know, when you have three characters, yeah. it's an yeah. interesting kind of shape and the idea of him being sort of the odd one out and you know, they are the twins, they have their twin thing and he's kind of on the outside. I was really drawn to that. But then ultimately I realized that the, the triangle that I was looking for, they were, they were more interesting triangles, basically. The triangle between the twins and their mother was more interesting. The triangle between the twins and then early when you meet him is more interesting. And then at some point their daughters are kind of that third point in the triangle. All of those were more interesting yeah. than this brother. Um, so, so I did end up cutting him. He was in, I think the first draft of the book um, and I ended up cutting him. So that was something that I um, discarded. I, I think a lot of other changes for this book were very structural. I, I, figuring out the timeline, figuring out sort of when events were going to happen, all of that was really difficult. But I think, um, I think maybe one of the sort of biggest 
kind of paths I didn't go down was was this younger brother who's just sort of on the outside of the twin bond looking in <laughs> and, and that was that was kind of his role to feel sort of left out and that just ultimately <laughs> wasn't compelling enough to me so I'm sorry yeah. I, I had to let him go <laughs> yeah my mine would have to be um I I think I might have started going about that business of explaining Liberia and Liberian history yeah. and all that. Yeah. Um, and I just, I just left that out. And I'm so glad yeah. that it's in all the projects you find yourself, especially like if it's a work that's classified as, you know, immigrant, an right, immigrant right, right. fiction in the larger capital C canon, then you feel right. <laughs> as if you have to sort of explain yes. your prefix, right? Yes. Um, yes. And it was liberating just to not do that, to, to, yeah. to explore what had happened for what yeah. it was, like um, use dialogue where I could, but otherwise I wasn't going to give you the entire history of, of Liberia, um, right. some aside chapter, you know what I mean? Right, right. Um, so yeah, that's, that's definitely something that I left out. Yeah. Um, there's a question pertaining to both of your, your fiction. Um, how do you maintain consistency with the characters you create? Mm. <laughs> maintain consistency through editing. <laughs> 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 through editing. Come on. I mean that you I think all of you you might slip up at any point during the process. I I think I do. Um mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's great to have time and space away from your work. Mm -hmm. approach it with fresh eyes and then say okay there's there's something here that's that's a bit off and then mm -hmm. um, I think at a, at a craft level I try to do and it's never been formal on paper but these sort of sociological um, outlines of mm -hmm. who the characters are what they fear mm -hmm. um, what they want what they dream things like that I like knowing mm -hmm. those things because those are what inform the scenes mm -hmm. um, inform their interactions yeah i mean i i agree and i also think it's also fine if characters are not consistent like i think i think what you want is for there to be an emotional journey that makes emotional sense um but beyond that like you know who among us is truly consistent and who we are you know i think I think having characters that do things that are unexpected or that surprise themselves by what they do or surprise others by what they do, um, I think all of that is is interesting and, and complex and real. I think it's more just thinking about, you know, what when you're thinking about choices that a character makes, that making some type of emotional sense. It doesn't have to make logical sense. It just has to make an emotional sense of why if, as you're tracking kind of the choices that they're making. Um, I think that, that that to me is the is the most important thing of just being able to to see how per someone someone gets from choice A to choice B by what they are feeling and deciding. Um, that makes more sense to me than if they are kind of you know inconsistent or flighty or or anything like that. I think. Yeah. Great. There are a couple questions asking you to speculate about characters if you <laughs> <laughs> are open to them. <laughs> Um, could you say more? Would you mean <laughs> okay, well, I'll just ask. So the first okay. is, um, the twins' lives took such drastically different courses, uh, each with their own unique hardships. Which twin do you think is happier? Uh, um, I mean, I think Desiree is probably happier. I think that that's uh, probably true. I think, you know, I, I was interested in the different journeys that they take and the way in which Stella has this trajectory that at least seems on the surface to be more satisfying. She has more money. She has a nice house. She ends up having a career that she wants to have versus Desiree. You know, it seems like, oh, well, she's just stuck in this little nowhere town. Uh, but I do think that Desiree has, has a sense of inner peace. Um, I don't know if Stella is someone who ever really feels at peace. Um, and I think that peace is really important. So I do think that Desiree's uh, journey and the loyalty that she displays to the people that she cares about. I think that that's something that that gives her a sense of peace and, and also the relationships that she have, I think, are, are the relationships seem so much tighter than the relationships that Stella has. So I do think I think Desiree is happier in the long run. Yeah. And then the other question is um, secrets are a central theme in the vanishing half. Um, 
Well, there's a spoiler in here, so I don't know if I want to give that away. It's okay. You don't have to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I, I want to preserve the, the novel for those who haven't read okay. it, so I, I should have... Yes. I should have screened this question better. No, no it's fine. <laughs> uh, no spoilers. Uh, no it's spoilers in, in the literati event zooms. <laughs> um, but um, there's, we're sort of winding down, coming to the top of the hour, and there's a question here that's actually my, one of my favorite questions um, for both of you, um, which is uh, what's currently on your bookshelves? What are you reading right now and enjoying? I just started um, Transcendent Kin Kingdom by mm -hmm. um, I have, um I'm gonna interview her in, a, in, a, in about a month or so. And I'm just, I'm, I'm a huge fan of her work and it's already starting off to be a treat. So that's what I've been reading. Nice. Yeah, I like that book a lot. Um, yeah, I have uh, Michael Denzel Smith's book, The Stakes Are High. Uh, I, I just started looking at uh, reading that one today. Um, and I've been rereading some Toni Morrison. I reread Sula and I'm rereading Song of Solomon mm -hmm. right now. So that's been really nice. Um, and lots of books that I'm looking forward to. Uh, I, lots of things that I'm, I'm looking forward to once I think life has slowed down a little bit, I can prioritize more of it, um, more of my, my reading time. Um, but I'm really excited to, to, I think rereading these Morrison novels has been, I think, like rereading Song of Solomon and, and like remembering the way that you felt when you read certain things the first time. Like, I'm like, yeah, I remembered that correctly, how that made me feel, um, which is awesome, I think, to encounter in a book or any type of medium. Mm -hmm. And if I can elaborate on the question or pivot from it a little bit, um, if, you're, if, you, if you are willing to share also in these times, I think we're also trying to find other media as well so if there's any anything that you're watching right now or listening to that you might want to recommend as well this i had this i'm experimenting with this as in my, sta in my stable of questions to offer <laughs> just get to not have to talk about books all the time yeah well i'll say i love um i'm still watching i may destroy you the mechanical yeah, that's show that's what i was gonna say okay we need to talk about it but <laughs> I'm, I'm not done yet and it, it's honestly it's funny it's bracing i can only watch like one episode at a time but it's so good um it's, she's she's a genius it's really yeah. good um, yeah so i've been loving that and then as far as listening I've, i love um, if you follow me on instagram then you know i love the new jesse Ware album um which is just like sophisticated disco. It's like exactly, it's sad that we have to listen to it inside. Like it's sad that it is now inside music because it should be outside music. Uh -huh. um, but it's it's just beautiful. And yeah, it's it's it just makes you think of like this luxurious night out that sadly none of us are having right now. But yeah. you will live vicariously through it. Just crank it up, um, dance a little bit. It's great, I love it. Yeah, um, I've been digging into, in addition to I May Destroy You, digging into um, Laura Mavula, um, and she is just such a brilliant musician. Uh, she is a singer based out of the UK, and her albums, I think her recent album, her last album was, was probably in like 2018 or so, mm -hmm. um, and she has like a live concert series that I've just been oh, reading, so it's been my, in, in the backdrop of pretty much Love the it. last two weeks. Love it. Well, thank you both so much for joining us this evening, for talking about your books, um, and also congratulations on their success. Um, it's weird to not be in the bookstore because I think this is the moment in the life cycle of, of both the dragons, the giant, the women, and the vanishing half when we'd sort of just, I'd be comfortable seeing them all the time as just our like <laughs> strong sellers and just being able to just gesture to them when people ask what they should be picking up and reading. Um, but I get to do that digitally or virtually. So if you've yet to purchase uh, Way Two or Brit's books, please do. You can do so at literatibookstore.com. Um, thanks again for joining us. Thanks all of you for tuning in tonight. Um, and uh, we'll see you at the next event. Take care all. Thank all right, you. Thanks everybody.